All right, here we are with another episode of On the D-Lo, and I am super excited. I have a good friend of mine in, Mr. Robin Reed. How are you, sir? I am doing just great. Thank you. How yeah. about yourself? I'm doing awesome. I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to bring you in today because, number one, you're super awesome. Uh, number two, we met, I don't know, 15 years ago? About maybe? that, yeah, maybe more. Yeah, and we were both doing something that we're very passionate about, and that was uh, working out. Um, I think we even, you know, uh, hit the showers at the same time. <laughs> uh, don't read into that, people. It's all good. Um, but yeah, we talked a lot about business and life and all that sort of stuff. And we, we certainly had a, um, let's just say, a passionate, you know, um, kinship that, you know, came into a friendship more and more as we got to, you know, know each other and do stuff. So I want to introduce you as a, um, I think the term's been used from my readings and from knowing you well enough, um, as a serial entrepreneur. That is me, yes. That is you, to yes. a T. Yes. So if you had to go through your disc performa, which one are you? Um, so I'm going to switch that because although I'm DISC certified, uh, I use something called Predictive Index. Okay. Uh, and to that end, I'm a captain. So I am someone who likes to innovate. Uh, I think big picture. I'm 30,000 foot view. The details don't resonate with me. Mm. That's where we hire people yeah. uh, to handle details so that I can think big. Uh, so that's that's really me, and I think that's why I'm such a good fit as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, because I'm a person that can take an idea and set it in motion. Right. But then I want to move to the next big idea while someone else keeps that motion going. I love that. That's a that's great. Okay. Um, you're a family man. Yeah. Uh, three kids, right? Yep. yep. And beautiful wife, who I know. Um, and you're in business with your wife, and, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, some of the other things that you're a part of, you're obviously you're a professional speaker, you're a coach. Um, OSP, kind of explain what that's yeah, about. So Occam Sustainability Partners is a consulting firm I created now almost 10 years ago uh, when we were starting to notice that we were seeing a, a quality mm -hmm. move towards sustainable and renewable energy. But a lot of people and companies just had no idea how to approach it. So, you know, it's one thing to go buy a, an L LED light for your home, but what do you do when you have a corporate space, a commercial building? Right. Are you, are you capturing all of the different ways that you can save money? And so I worked with a great guy who was a mentor to me, a guy named Bill Lear. He mentored me, taught me about it, created this amazing uh, formula where I could plug in because energy is pretty straightforward. It's kilowatt hours of energy used, what's the cost per kilowatt hour? Mm -hmm. And just had this great formula where I could show someone on paper before they ever made a single purchase how much money they would save doing exactly what they already do, turning the lights on at the same time, turning them off at the same time. And it just turned into some really exciting things that allowed me to travel the world to learn about different sustainable technologies are, that are out there yeah. and uh, methodologies that were being used. And I would bring that back. And this company turned into this wonderful little living thing that was about matching, peop matching problems and solutions. So mm -hmm. I'd travel around learning about solutions, and people would contact me sharing their problems, and I would just match them. That's uh, perfect. It, it, was, it was a lot of fun. That's uh, what you love doing. Uh, yes, it is. Match, just matching people up is, is probably my, that's my happy place. Yeah, we're very similar in that to where I'm, I'm now self-proclaimed as the connector and protector, protector for insurance, and, mm -hmm. and you do a lot of that same connecting. You've yeah. connected me with a lot of people, which is amazing, and you, I thank you. The, the term I've, I've given myself is, um, so if you're familiar with the word confluence, the uh, yeah. confluence is the coming together of two things to make a bigger thing. So two streams that make a river, two rivers that go into a lake, that sort of thing. I call myself a confluencer. I'm a connector and an oh, influencer. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, very cool. Um, and then I, I would, obviously, you're a part of um, a couple other things, too. I, you're the president of the Black Chamber of Commerce, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. And that's 10 years now? How long? Uh, well, six years as the president and CEO, four years prior on the board of directors. Okay, so a total of 10 years. Yep. Um, has that been pretty fruitful for you? I mean, just being able to help people and... That has been wonderful. Um, you know, I was... I'm a, In that regard, I'm a reluctant CEO. I sat on the board. We transitioned uh, a previous CEO out of the role, and the board asked me to step in as an interim CEO, and I have other businesses, and said, yeah, ah, I'll come in as a chief operating officer. Let me clean up some of the business aspects of it. That's, a, that's one of my skill sets. And uh, I, I did so for a year, and we had 
completed a CEO search, and I thought I was in a meeting to select one of the two final candidates. I did not apply for the position. Right. And an executive from Cox Communications, who's on the board, said, you know, for the last year, I've enjoyed the communication. I've enjoyed the progress we've made. And I think that the only way to continue that is if Robin stays on as president. Yeah, yeah. And I said, okay, here's my view of how we can be better. That was the goal. I didn't want to just come in and run what has been operating for 23 years uh, here in Arizona. Right. I didn't want to just come in and do that. And so they really uh, allowed me to share my view, which was what I wanted to do was become a more relevant organization. Yeah. I wanted to be part of the bigger conversations, the proverbial seat at the table. I wanted to make sure that we had a seat at every table, Yeah. Uh, but in a way that was constructive and productive, right? We are not a protest organization. We are not an advocacy organization. I, we don't take a political position, and we are never going to be the group that is um, marching on the freeway, keeping hardworking people from getting right. home at the end of the day, yeah. right? So I wanted to be part of the bigger picture, and, and the board has really uh, supported me in that and and we have been very successful in doing exactly that yeah and and knowing you has has i know you and understanding and even being in the black you know chamber a few times and the introductions you've made i mean at the end of the day it's a it's a human organization yes yeah. yes and and you're doing wonderful things yeah. so that's really cool it's, it's awesome to have somebody such as yourself in there making a difference and like you said not doing the same old same old and that can be true for any industry we have it in insurance i've seen it in the music business i mean all that sort of stuff i mean everything's always evolving and changing and it's a matter of like looking into the into the scope and going okay what is this and how do we pivot with it you know exactly not against it exactly um Okay, so you were, at 19, you were a licensed stockbroker? That's me, yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> I, I worked for Charles Schwab, uh, gosh, this is back in the 1980s. Uh, I have the dubious distinction of having been a stockbroker on Black Monday. Uh, <laughs> and I can tell stories about how literally that Monday happened, and we slept in the corporate offices for the entire week. We never went home because Schwab at that point had, had received approval for 24-hour trading, and it was just that busy. You, you took cat naps, and you got up, and you, you executed uh, trade orders, and we did that for an entire week, probably one of the best, best experiences I've had in terms of work ethic and discretionary effort. It, it really taught me a lot about leadership and, and yeah. watching Schwab and that team get so many people to give so much discretionary effort because we believed in what the organization was about. And I always told myself, when I own companies, that's what I want. Yeah, yeah. And so being a stockbroker, and, and I think I met you when you were at Merrill Lynch, I believe. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so after that, was that your last um, uh, sort of job in that spectrum? Yes, okay. yes. And I, and I I applaud all those that do it and do it well. Yeah. I did it well. I didn't enjoy it. And that was the thing. You weren't living your yeah, passion. You yeah. got to a point. Yep. And so now I – and it's funny, knowing you from, from then, then to now and seeing the, the gleam in your eye and the, when we have conversations at breakfast or, you know, we're just hanging out, um, I feel the passion more with what you're doing now, which is great. Absolutely. So – I wanted to bring you in because, you know, people that have listened to the podcast and people that are now new to this, my, my goal, as we were speaking beforehand, is to always bring in people that I think have an added value that can lend some sort of added value through their specialty with who they are. And, and, and maybe there's nuggets here that people can kind of pull out. And so I'm leaving this company, and let me see if I'm pronouncing right, Influent. Correct. Okay. So I'm leaving that last because I really want you to dive in deep about what this um, company with your wife that you guys own, what your successes have been, what you guys, um, you know, what it entails, what it does, because it's very business um, savvy, but it's also people savvy. It's about that culture and, and getting to know people. And, and so I want to hear a lot about this, how it can help people listening. Absolutely. So let me give you a little bit of the origin of the name. Please. So m first off, my wife comes from a very strong background as a benefits consultant. She was um, senior Vice President of Strategy for Arizona's largest benefits consulting firm. She's worked for in a, in a VP role for each of the nation's largest benefits consulting firms. So she had this strong background in working with HR professionals to provide value to the workforce within an organization. And that's just, it's such a unique and, and complementary skill to my own. My skill is talking to the C-suite 
I'm comfortable there. It comes from my background uh, as a stockbroker where I managed all of the restricted stock. Mm -hmm. So I talked to executives every day about what they could sell and what they couldn't sell. Uh And so we created a company um, on the belief that the biggest challenge within organizations is twofold, communication and alignment. And so when we took communication, we said, okay, well, we're talking about employees and employers, and there's a language that's spoken in inside of every company. And what we do is help people become fluent in that language. So it's employee-employer fluency. Oh, Employee is how we came up with yeah. the name. And what we do is, so we have kind of two divisions of the company. I handle more the corporate side. So I do executive coaching to top-level CEOs. Uh, and I work with the leadership team to create strategic alignment. Uh, the way I share with them is that much like your car tires or your spine, when you're out of alignment, when it first happens, it's an inconvenience. Then it's discomfort, but then it goes on to create serious problems, mm-hmm. right? Your car wobbles, then it shakes, then you, you know, then, then you're in real trouble. You need to have something redone in the car. Same with your spine, right? It's a little awkward. Your body makes adjustments, but pretty soon the adjustments become the normality, and now you are walking funny or you're... It, it affects your whole body. Absolutely, your, yeah. your entire being. And so we say that's the same thing that happens with companies. If you have a misaligned executive team, let's say you have five executives, and you don't all agree on what your company stands for. Mm -hmm. What does it do? Are you a growth company? Are you process and precision? Are you teamwork and human capital? Well, if everyone doesn't agree, it's on the C-suite, then everyone downline from them is rowing in a different direction. And what we do is help companies, we've all heard the term, you know, rowing in the same direction, but that's really not complete. We help you row in the same direction for the same length of time at the same pace, because if you take any one of those away, you will end up off course. So we keep you it, focused on all three at all times. Wow, that's um, that's a mouthful. <laughs> so how is it? Um, how is it like starting a company with your wife? It's fantastic, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Well, you know, you you know, so you know my relationship with my wife Shauna. She is, you know, not cliche. She is my best friend. We, yeah. We love spending time together. We're that couple that if we could, we'd do everything together. We golf together several times yeah. a week. We obviously vacation together, but we like being around each other. So it's nice. And at the same time, but, but hold, hold, being around each other and working together are two I, 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 different I know, things. I know. So, and I, <laughs> and I was gonna say, but. We also understood early on that we really couldn't bring our marriage dynamic into the workplace. Okay. I think in many relationships, even if there are partners, there are some someone has a more dominant personality in the relationship. Yeah, and that tends to be me. That's just my nature. So what we did was figured out where our strengths lied, and then we let each other have those strengths to themselves. So if it comes to dealing with workforce, that. Everything runs through her. Nothing runs through me. Mm -hmm. We collaborate on things where we think a joint decision is required. But other than that, her division is hers. Mine is mine. We run it like a business. We have weekly business meetings that have a set start time, set end time, and a set agenda. Of course you do, Robin. (laughs) Yes. yes. So that that when work ends, it ends. Because one of the the, the pitfalls of, of just working, you know, from a home office, which the pandemic had us doing. Uh, and then when you add that to a marriage, otherwise you, your life becomes this one long something, but it isn't defined. So we have a start of a work day and we have the end of a work day so that we understand, okay, we're not business partners right now. We're yeah. husband and wife and we're going to go for a walk or go shopping or hit, hit the pool or something so that we make sure our life has that appropriate uh, separation yeah. so that we can enjoy all of it. Right. Right. Because I don't I don't strive for work-life balance. I, I think that is a, a, a policy. Um, what we work for is work-life fulfillment. Yes. Right. I, yes. Wa- I want to find joy in all that I am doing when I'm doing it. But it reverts back to what you said earlier. You didn't have the passion in what you're doing anymore. Now you do, and that passion is just basically a passion for living. I mean, yes. even thinking this morning, I think you'll agree to this, I'm thinking to myself, I think I even posted on Instagram, I'm like, okay, I'm going out on my day, and you know what? It's not really a work day. It's just another day because I'm so excited to see Robin today or my appointment this morning or this and that. I mean, that's what it's all about, I think, if it, people can find that. It really is. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a follower of... Uh, Roman philosophers and 
Uh, I happen to read, you know, Marcus Aurelius' mm. Meditations on an ongoing Good basis. Yeah. But one of the things about it that really resonated for me was that in life, there is no good, there is no bad. Right. It, it just is. And so when you accept something as it is, you can then determine what you want to, how you want to quantify that experience. Yes. Good and bad is what we say is good and bad because how many times in life have we found ourselves in a place that we are so happy and fulfilled and if you look back three years, you had to go through something horrible to get there. To get there. So was it horrible or was it necessary? Mm-hmm. So we so we really strive for uh, for work life fulfillment. I will tell you, and and this is the best way I can describe how my life works. If for those that celebrate Christmas or whatever other significant event where there's anticipation for that specific date, yeah. for me it was Christmas. I love Christmas time. I love Christmas Day, and I can remember as a child. Uh, on Christmas Eve, barely being able to fall asleep because I was just so excited about right. Christmas Day, right? I live every day of my life like that. I am so excited yes. for what I'm, I'm enjoying today, but I'm so excited for what tomorrow has to offer yeah. that sometimes I really I have a hard time either going to sleep or staying asleep because I'm so excited for what the next day will bring. And I, that's what I infuse into my coaching is I want to help executives get back to that place, yeah. to get back to that thing where they understand that being a CEO is just a wonderful opportunity, but make sure you're doing it for the right reason yeah. and that you are getting all the joy from that. That you possibly can. Wouldn't you say part of being a CEO and, and being in that position that you're in is creating your day and your days of he- <clears throat> ahead so that you're always looking forward to it, per se? Absolutely. And so if there's things that don't really align or fit with you or you're just not sure about it, then why are you doing it at this point in your career? Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. And and I will, you know, I will share with people, I worked to get to that place, right? I, there yes. Were, there were jobs where I had to do the work. Uh, but sometimes it was because of the money. But sometimes I just needed the experience. You know, you, you you just can't you can't go from, you know, startup to CEO overnight in terms of true CEO, where you're managing not only your life and your family, right. but you have employees and they have families. Mm-hmm. The best CEOs understand that. The best CEOs I've ever met are the ones that understand that I am now responsible for not only all the people in my building. But all the people that are impacted by them. So, yeah. you, hey, if that person works for me and they have a, a spouse and kids at home, what I do every day in, in, impacts what they do every day, even when they're not in the building. Yes. Yeah. And so it's that understanding. And that creates a leader that understands things like when someone gets a, a call that one of the kids is at school and not feeling well. You understand, right? There's no one cheated you. Right. That's a human being living a normal life. Yeah. And you celebrate that. And what you do is you send that person off to to grab their child to say, go make sure they're okay. We'll see you when you come back. Not can you be back this afternoon. Right. We'll see you when you get back because they know when that person comes back with a clear mind, they're yeah. going to put forth better work than if they'd stay there the entire day stressed out. Okay, this is great. So here's an important point, and I think this is great for everybody listening, and I want you to elaborate on this, because this is what I've just started, not just started, but in the last, I don't know, maybe five to six years really have partaken with my 11 employees, and you just brought up a great example of for if you're young, old, whatever, entrepreneur that has a smaller business per se, and you're the one that's in charge, and you have those stresses of like, you know, I got payroll, I got this, I got that. And then you also have the stresses of other humans, you know, making sure that they're okay, taking care of, also hoping that, you know, you have the right person in the right place doing the right job sort of aspect. And a lot of what I've created here, which is amazing, is that if you need to work from home, today because you know maybe your kids are out for school cool do your thing just you know you'll you know what to do just kind of you know go do that or if you need to leave early because you got to go pick up you know joey at the cool go do that do you advice to people that own their own businesses and that do you um and and based on your experience of what you've seen or what you heard have you found that businesses are almost too stringent on the rules inside their head of what it has to be because they're worried about all these ancillary things. And like you said, it just creates basically more uh, kinks in the armor because they're worried about the wrong thing and not taking care of the right thing. Absolutely. So what I find is that many CEOs 
are always living to what their belief is mm-hmm. of what a CEO is versus be the CEO of your company. Don't try to be the CEO of a company you used to work for that you wish had operated <laughs> differently. Just be the CEO of your own company. Yeah. Understand that the way it works well is when the employer understands that there is no business without the employee and the employee understands there is no business without the employer. Yeah, mutual respect. Right. You are partners. You just have different responsibilities, like any other partnership. But you just have different responsibilities. And yes, I think that that CEOs have become a little too restrictive. Uh, I have consulted to so many, especially relative to the pandemic, the return to work concept. And I'm asking them, well, let's talk about this. I understand business very well. So I say, okay, let's just talk about what's important. Yeah. Business ha- Businesses have to make money. That's actually why a business is a business. Other- a otherwise, it's a hobby, right. right? Hobbies cost money. Businesses make money. So yeah. you're there to make money. Nothing wrong with that. However, if if you are treating your employees like they are tools that help you build something for you, you've missed the point, right? right? So when we're talking about return to work, I, I consulted to so many CEOs and I'd say, okay, well, where are you in terms of the pandemic? Well, actually, you know, productivity is up 40%. We're getting more done. Like, okay, but everybody's at home, yeah. So why do you want them back in the office? Well, I, I would just feel better. I understand that. But if you've just been proven as a business person that you can increase productivity and revenue Mm -hmm. by a significant percentage by letting somebody work in an environment where they feel more productive, why would you want to get rid of that productivity so that you can feel good being able to look out your door and see people sitting in seats? If you answered to a board of directors and you had to explain to them why production dropped 40%, what excuse would you really be able to give them? And they started to understand. But it took going through that process and saying, be a business person. Yeah. But understand, right. this is every every business, I don't care what you what your widget is, every business is a people business. Yes. It's every, a team teamwork know. relationship, all that. That's that's really good stuff. So you had talked about Marcus Aurelius. I, I have his readings as well. What what are a couple other books that you would recommend for people? Oh gosh. Um, so many. I, I, I'm a voracious reader. Uh, another one I like is called The Compassionate Samurai. I like that. And it takes the it takes the the, the teachings and the legacy of the art of the samurai. Okay. And it applies it to business. Nice. And so it basically, it, again, it's just a, a lot of understanding. If you understand, if you follow any of the kind of Eastern philosophies, a lot of that has to do with flow, mm-hmm. right? That that we, that in the U.S. we tend to always want to power through right. something versus um, going with the flow, seeing where it takes us, seeing where our opportunity yeah. might exist. You know, like they say, you know, water finds its own path. It's, that, it's that. It's so true with physical movement. How we how do how we look at it here. Everybody's here, so, you know, wanting to get jacked all the time. And when you put it in perspective of somebody that's just in flow and doing things and stretching their body out and doing all those things, they seem to be in better shape for a longer period because yes. you're investing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I like that. Yeah. Eastern philosophies are great. Um, your passion and your love for golf. Every time we talk, you're always talking about how much you love golf, this and that. But this is a question I have for you. How does golf, when you're out there and in your mind and in your mindset, how how can that or how does it relate to somebody running their business? Oh, that's a, I love that question, but it's easy. Yeah. Golf is always about the present. You hit one golf shot at a time. You can't hit two at a time. You can't take away a shot you've already hit. I love it. It is being absolutely present in the moment over the ball that you are hitting right now. Mm -hmm. If I hit it well, awesome. But there's nothing I can do about it anyway. (laughs) If I hit it poorly, too bad. But there's nothing I can do about it anyway. So it's saying, what am I going to do from where I am now? If my ball is in the woods, what am I going to do from here? If it's in the fairway, what am I going to do? Isn't that business? Every day, every moment, we think, where can I take my business from where I sit right now? Yeah. Because I can't figure out what to do from where it was a year ago, and I'm not next year yet. All I have is right now. Golf reminds you to be present. Yeah, and it's a form of meditation, I would assume. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because when I golf, my phone is not on. 
Um, I'm the pr- I don't I don't play music when I golf. For me, I I truly want in that moment. Yeah, it's almost a Zen time for me. I'm very I'm very quiet. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of my um, when people talk to me and they're like, you know, do you, you know what is meditation to you, or do you meditate? And and I think everybody has their niche. And for you, like you had said, it's golf. For me, I go take guitar lessons when I'm in the moment of playing guitar because I suck so bad, even though I've been doing it for so long. I still need to focus on what what is the tune I'm playing and where are my fingers at, and that's all I'm thinking about. Like I'm not thinking about like what's in the fridge, you know, or you know what meeting I have next. Right. And that's a good exactly. place to be. And I think that's a good lesson for. Anybody that um, needs that time away from the stresses of you know normal everyday life, right. and that's good that you take that time out to to do that sort of stuff. Um, you're on a ton of board of directors. I am. What what are what what are some of the benefits that you get out of doing that and giving back and being a part of these things? Well, probably the first one is um, the ability to meet new people so that I can make new connections. Good. Um, but every board on which I serve, I believe in the organization. I, as an entrepreneur, I very rarely need anything for a resume. So yeah. I, don't, I don't do it to boost a resume, but I do it because um, I believe in the organization and its mission. And so it's great to be able to bring my connections or my influence to that organization to help them achieve things for the greater good. Yeah. Right. So to me, that's being able to give a little of myself that ends up being a lot for others. And, you know, that's the best ROI in the world, right? To give to others and have that expand beyond even what you were capable of giving on your own. Isn't it a great feeling to give a referral as opposed to getting it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, you know, I tell people it's odd because when I use LinkedIn, uh, when I try to engage with people on LinkedIn, I tell them I use LinkedIn as a referral tool. I don't use LinkedIn as a way to source business. Right. Business will come, but I don't do transactional things. I do relationship-based things. So I don't take every client that wants to work with me because I have to feel like there's a relationship there. And to that end... Um, it's about building more relationships. I mean, what a wonderful life you get to live when you just are helping people with nothing expected in return. Yeah, it's fulfilling. And I mean, you're you're in your fifties. Uh, we'll yeah, say. nice try. I'm sixty. Um, okay, so he's sixty. Whatever. Um, it's that beautiful skin of yours. So, well, I'm Italian. I'm yeah. kind of close. Um, you get to it. Okay, at sixty. Obviously, let's let's reverse back a little bit. At what point in your life was that the mantra? Because there was a certain part where you're you're struggling, you're hungry, you, you need to get the business in. And yes, you you were you're always the same person. You want to refer and you want to help people. But now you're in that zone where it's like I want to help pe- more people now because I know business is just coming to me. Yeah, and 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 it was the realization that I had that backwards. Yeah. Yeah, the business was coming to me because I was helping people. Correct. It wasn't because I got to a place where now I could help people. You can help anyone can help anyone else from wherever you stand. Yeah. I, as a lifelong learner, you realize I can learn something from everybody, everybody, no matter their everyone. age or anything. Um, and so in business, I learned I can be that connector. Yeah. No matter what's happening in my life, I'm not connecting you to me. I'm connecting you to someone else. So it really has very little to do with me other than I know two two entities yeah. uh, that will benefit from each other. So I would say it's probably been 20 years now okay. since that's been the right thing for me, where I knew it was the right thing. And it's because much like um, sports or training or being healthy, you get to know your body really well, right? I, I know right away if something's mm, off. It's a good analogy. Right? Yeah. So when you when you know that, you also know when everything's right. Right. And yeah. I start paying attention. I start paying attention to uh, my mental approach. And I realized that when I was referring people, I would get an endorphin rush. Mm-hmm. It would feel exciting to me. And there was not, I knew I wasn't getting anything direct from it but that feeling even if no one ever said anything if they never said thank you if they never that feeling of giving felt good to me yeah and so i just kept doing it and interestingly as i kept doing it what people were connecting to yeah was my passion yeah 
and people want to do business with people that are passionate they about what they want to be around doing. that energy. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, yeah, so it was a great thing to do. That's awesome. Um, okay. Lastly, I want to know what you um, what you see as far as in businesses. What are some of the what are some of the traits of the most successful businesses that you've dealt with? And just give us like three of them. Um, well, first, I'll, I'll start with the Richard Branson quote because I think it it creates the foundation for it all. He says, "Take care of your people. Your people will take care of your customers." And your customers will take care of your bottom line. I love that. Quote. And, the, and he says that's the only way it works. Yeah. Right. And I agree with that. Yeah. Um, the other thing I've seen is that willingness to step outside of your belief system, mm-hmm. your your ingrained belief system, to embrace yeah. something new, to embrace something new. The best business owners I see are the ones who are always curious. They're always curious. They want to learn about the next thing. It may be I learned about it and it's not a good fit. Yeah. Or I learned about it and I want to be on the leading edge of that. Uh, but that's the, I would say those are the two. Take care of your people and stay curious. And find a way to stay hungry, right? That, that, that hunger, that passion you had when you started the business, that hunger and passion you had when you went to grow your business. Yeah. Well, now that it's there and it's taking really good care of you, you have a wonderful lifestyle, don't let go of the hunger. And if you find that you are letting go of the hunger a little bit and it's turned into a job for you, 